Mental attitude makes the difference. So it was mental attitude that motivated Jerry Assam and the salesmen under him to find satisfaction in their jobs. It was a controlled, positive mental attitude which helped the young student earn the reward and satisfaction he sought. Just look about you. Notice those people who enjoy their work and those who don't. What's the difference between them? Happy, satisfied persons control their mental attitude. They take a positive view of their situation. They look for the good, and when something isn't so good, they look first to themselves to see if they can improve it. They try to learn more about their work so that they can become more proficient and make their work more satisfying to themselves and their employer. But those who are unhappy clutch their NMA tightly. Indeed, it is almost as if they want to be unhappy. They look for everything about which they can complain. The hours are too long. Lunch hours are too short. The boss is too crabby. The company doesn't give enough holidays or the right kind of bonuses. Or maybe they even complain about irrelevant things, such as, Susie wears the same dress every day, John the bookkeeper doesn't write legibly, and so on and so on. Anything, just so they can be unhappy. And they succeed very well, too. They are decidedly unhappy people, on the job and generally elsewhere, too. NMA possesses them entirely. And this is true regardless of the type of work involved. If you want to be happy and satisfied, you can be. You will control your mental attitude and reverse your talisman from NMA to PMA. You will look for ways and means to create happiness. If you can bring happiness and enthusiasm into your work situation, you'll be making a contribution that few others could equal. You will make your work fun and your job satisfaction will be measured in smiles and in productivity too. A definite goal made her enthusiastic. In one of our classes, we were talking about this principle of bringing enthusiasm into one's job when a young lady in the rear of the classroom raised her hand. She got to her feet and said, I've come here with my husband. What you say may be all right for a man in business, but it's no good for a housewife. You men have new and interesting challenges every day, but it's not like that with housework. The trouble with housework is, it's just too darn daily. This seemed like a real challenge to us. There are a lot of people who have jobs that are just too darn daily. If we could find some way to help this young lady, perhaps we could help others who thought their work was routine. We asked her what made her housework seem so daily, and it turned out that she had no sooner finished making the beds when they were dirtied again, washing the dishes when they were soiled again, cleaning the floors when they were muddied again. You just get these things done so they can get undone, she said. It does seem frustrating, the instructor agreed. Are there any women who do enjoy housework? Well, yes, I guess there are, she said. What did they find in housework to interest them and keep them enthusiastic? After a moment's thought, the young woman replied, Maybe it's their attitude. They don't seem to think their work is confining. They seem to see something beyond the routine. This was the crux of the problem. One of the secrets of job satisfaction is being able to see beyond the routine. It is knowing that your work is leading somewhere. This is true whether you are a housewife or a file clerk, a gasoline pump operator, or the president of a large corporation. You'll find satisfaction in routine chores only when you see them as stepping stones. Each chore a stone, leading in a direction that you choose. Use the Stepstone Theory The answer then for this young housewife was to find some goal which she really wanted to achieve and to find a way to make her routine daily housework lead to the attainment of that goal. She volunteered the information that she had always wanted to take her family on a trip around the world. All right, the instructor said, we'll settle on that. Now set yourself a time limit. When do you want to go? When the baby is twelve years old, she said, that will be six years from now. Now let's see. This will take a little doing. You'll need money, for one thing. Your husband will have to be able to take off for a year. You will have to plan an itinerary. 
you will want to study up on the countries you will be visiting. Do you suppose you can find a way to let bed-making, dishwashing, floor-scrubbing, and meal-planning be stepping stones toward your goal? A few months later, the lady in this story came to see us. It was apparent the minute she walked into the room that here was a woman who had succeeded proudly. It's amazing, she told us, how well this stepping stone idea has worked. I haven't found a single chore that doesn't fit in. I use my cleaning time as a thinking and planning time. Shopping time is a wonderful time to expand our horizons. I deliberately buy foods from other countries, foods that we will be eating on our trip, and I use the meal time as a teaching time. If we are having Chinese egg noodles, I read all I can find about China and its people, and then at dinner, I tell the family all about them. Not one of my duties is dull or uninteresting to me anymore, and I know they never will be again, thanks to the stepstone theory. So no matter how humdrum or tiresome your job may be, if at the end of it you see a goal that you desire, that job can bring satisfaction to you. This is a situation which confronts many persons in all walks of life. One young man may want to be a doctor, but he has to work his way through school. The job he takes will be decided by many factors such as hours, location, rate of pay, and so on. Aptitude will have little to do with it. A very intelligent, ambitious young man may end up behind a soda fountain, washing cars, or digging ditches. Certainly the job offers him no challenge or stimulation. It is merely a means to an end. Yet because he knows he is going where he wants to go, to him whatever strains the job may impose on him are worth the end result. Sometimes, however, the price to be paid on a given job is too high in relation to the goal which it will purchase. And if such a job should happen to be yours, change your job. For if you are unhappy at your job, the poisons of this dissatisfaction spread into every phase of living. If, however, the job is worth the price but you are still unhappy, develop inspirational dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction can be positive or negative, good or bad, depending upon the circumstances. Remember, a positive mental attitude is the right mental attitude in a given situation. Develop Inspirational Dissatisfaction Charles Becker, former president of Franklin Life Insurance Company, says, I would urge that you be dissatisfied. Not dissatisfied in the sense of disgruntlement, but dissatisfied in the sense of that divine discontent, which throughout the history of the world has produced all real progress and reform. I hope you will never be satisfied. I hope you will constantly feel the urge to improve and perfect not only yourself, but the world around you. Inspirational dissatisfaction can motivate persons from sinner to saint, failure to success, poverty to riches, defeat to victory, and misery to happiness. What do you do when you make a mistake? When things go wrong? When misunderstandings develop with others? When you meet defeat? When everything seems black, when it appears that there is no way to turn, when it looks as if a satisfactory solution to your problem is impossible, do you do nothing and allow disaster to overtake you? Do you fold up, become frightened, run away? Or do you develop inspirational dissatisfaction? Do you turn disadvantages into advantages? Do you determine what you want? Do you apply faith? clear thinking, and positive action, knowing that desirable results can and will be achieved. Napoleon Hill says, Every adversity has the seed of an equivalent benefit. Isn't it true that in the past what seemed to be a great difficulty or an unfortunate experience has inspired you to success and happiness that might not otherwise have been achieved? Inspirational dissatisfaction can motivate you to succeed. Albert Einstein was dissatisfied because Newton's laws didn't answer all his questions. So he kept inquiring into nature and higher mathematics until he came up with the theory of relativity. And from that theory, the world has developed the method of breaking the atom, learned the secret of transmuting energy into matter and vice versa, 
and dared and succeeded to conquer space, and all sorts of amazing things we very likely would not have accomplished if Einstein had not developed inspirational dissatisfaction. Now, of course, we are not all Einsteins, and what results from our inspirational dissatisfaction may not change the world, but it can change our world, and we can move forward in the direction we want to go. Let us tell you what happened to Clarence Lancer when he became dissatisfied with his job. Was it worth it? Now, Clarence Lancer had been a streetcar conductor in Canton, Ohio for years. And one day, he woke up in the morning and decided that he didn't like his job. It was too much the same. He was sick and tired of it. The more Clarence thought about the matter, the more dissatisfied he became. And he seemed to be unable to quit thinking about it. His dissatisfaction grew almost to an obsession. Clarence was mightily dissatisfied. But when you have worked for a company as long as Clarence had worked for his streetcar company, you don't just quit because you decide that you are unhappy. At least, not if you are interested in whether or not your bread will be buttered. Besides, Clarence had taken the PMA Science of Success course, and he had learned that one could be happy on any job if one wanted to. The thing to do was to adopt the right attitude. So Clarence decided to take a sensible view of the situation and see what he could do about it. How can I be happier on the job, he asked himself. And he came up with a very good answer indeed. He decided that he would be happier if he made others happy. Now there were many people whom he could make happy, for he met many folks on his streetcar every day. He had always been able to make friends readily, so he thought... I'll use this trait to make each day a little brighter for every person who boards my car. Clarence's plan was wonderful, the customers thought. They enjoyed his little courtesies and cheerful greetings immensely, and they were happier, and so was Clarence, as the result of his cheerfulness and consideration. But his supervisor took the opposite attitude. So the supervisor called Clarence in and warned him to stop all this unwanted affability. But Clarence paid no attention to the warning. He was having a good time making others happy, and as far as he and the customers were concerned, he was making a terrific success of his job. Clarence was fired. So Clarence had a problem, and that was good. At least according to the PMA Science of Success course, it was good. Clarence decided that perhaps he had better visit Napoleon Hill, who was living in Canton at the time, and see how and why this problem was so good. He called Mr. Hill and arranged for an appointment the next afternoon. I've read Think and Grow Rich, Mr. Hill, and I've studied the PMA science of success, but somewhere I must have gotten off on the wrong track. And he told Napoleon Hill what had happened to him. Now what do I do, he concluded. Napoleon Hill smiled. Let's look at your problem, he said. You were dissatisfied with your work as it was. You did exactly right. You tried to use your best asset, your friendly and affable disposition, to do a better job and get and give more satisfaction on the job. The problem arises from the fact that your superior didn't have the imagination to see the value of what you were doing. But that's wonderful. Why? Because now you are in a position to use your fine personality for even greater goals. And Napoleon Hill showed Clarence Lancer that he could use his fine abilities and friendly disposition to much better advantage as a salesman than as a streetcar conductor. So Clarence applied for and got a job as an agent for the New York Life Insurance Company. The first prospect Clarence called on was the president of the streetcar company. Clarence turned his personality loose on this gentleman and came out of the office with an application for a $100,000 policy. The last time Hill saw Lancer, he had become one of New York Life's biggest producers. Are you a square peg in a round hole? The characteristics, abilities, and capacities that make you happy and successful in one environment may create an opposite reaction in another. You have a tendency to do well what you want to do. You are called a square peg in a round hole when you work or engage in activities that do not come naturally and that are inwardly repellent. 
In such an unhappy situation, you can change your position and place yourself in an environment that is pleasing to you. It may not be feasible to change your position. You can then make adjustments in your environment to coincide with your characteristics, abilities, and capacities so that you will be happy. When you do this, you square the whole. This solution will help change your attitude from negative to positive. If you develop and maintain a burning desire to do so, you can even neutralize and change your tendencies and habits by establishing new ones. You can round the peg if you are sufficiently motivated. But before you achieve success in changing your tendencies and habits, be prepared to face mental and moral conflicts. You can win if you are willing to pay the price. You may find it difficult to pay each necessary installment, particularly the first few. But when you have paid in full, the newly established traits will predominate. The old tendencies and habits will become dormant. You will be happy because you will be doing what now comes naturally. To guarantee success, it is desirable that you try zealously to maintain physical, mental, and moral health during the period of such an internal struggle. In the next chapter, Your Magnificent Obsession, you will see how to neutralize your mental conflicts. Pilot Number 14 Thoughts to Steer By 1. Satisfaction is a Mental Attitude 2. Your own mental attitude is the one thing you possess over which you alone have complete control. 3. Memorize. I feel healthy. I feel happy. I feel terrific. 4. When you set a goal, aim higher. 5. Know the rules and understand how to apply them. 6. Set your target and keep trying until you hit it. 7. See beyond the routine. Use the stepstone theory. 8. Develop inspirational dissatisfaction. 9. What do you do if you are a square peg in a round hole? Defeat may be a stepping stone or a stumbling block, depending on whether your attitude is positive or negative. Chapter 15 Your Magnificent Obsession With the idea that we are about to give you, you can have riches far beyond your fondest hope. This idea will bring you a wealth of happiness, for your personality will expand, and you will receive affection and love both of a quality and a quantity you have never before dreamed possible. This principle was expressed dramatically on many occasions by the author Lloyd C. Douglas. When Douglas retired from the ministry, he moved into a more extended form of inspirational teaching, the writing of novels. His ministry had reached hundreds. His books reached thousands. His movies, millions and to each he preached the same basic message. But it was never so clearly expressed as in the novel The Magnificent Obsession. The principle is so obvious here that those who need it most may not see it at all. It is simply this. Develop an obsession, a magnificent obsession, to help others. Share yourself without expecting a reward, payment, or commendation. And above all else, keep your good turn a secret. And if you do this, you will set in motion the powers of a universal law. For try as you will to avoid payment for your good deed, blessings and rewards will be showered upon you. No matter who you are, you can have a magnificent obsession. Every living person can help others by sharing a part of himself. You don't have to be rich or powerful to develop a magnificent obsession. Regardless of who you are or what you have been, you can create inside yourself a burning desire to be helpful to others. Take, for example, the sinner with a magnificent obsession. You'll never know his name. That's a secret. When he was asked to help the Boys Clubs of America, an organization the sole purpose of which is the building of character in children with a small donation, he refused. In fact, 
he was more than rude to the man who had called to interview him on this occasion. Get out, he said. I'm sick and tired of people asking me for money. As the representative was walking toward the door to leave, he stopped, turned around, and looked kindly at the man sitting behind his desk. You may not wish to share with the needy, but I do. I'll share with you a part of what I have, a prayer. May God bless you. And then he turned swiftly and left. You see, with a flash of inspiration, the boys club representative had remembered, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. And a few days later, an interesting thing happened. The man who had said, Get out, knocked on the door of the club representative's office and asked, May I come in? He brought with him a part of what he had to share, a check for half a million dollars. As he laid the check on the desk, he said, I am giving this on one condition, that you never let anyone know that I did it. Why not, he was asked. I don't want my name to represent to boys and girls that I am good. I'm not a saint, for I have been a sinner. And that is why you'll never know his name. Just he, the boys' club representative, and the greatest giver of all, know the name of the sinner whose money was donated for the purpose of helping boys and girls avoid doing the wrong things he had done. Like the boys' club representative, you may not have money, but you can share by giving a part of what you have. And like him, you can be a part of a great cause. And you too, when you give, can give generously. Your most preciously valued possessions and your greatest powers are often necessarily invisible and intangible. No one can take them. You and you alone can share them. The more you share, the more you will have. Now if you doubt this, you can prove it to yourself by giving a smile to everyone you meet, a kind word, a pleasant response, appreciation with warmth from the heart, cheer, encouragement, hope, honor, credit, and applause, good thoughts, evidence of love for your fellow men, happiness, a prayer for the godless and the godly, and time for a worthy cause with eagerness. If you do experiment by giving any one of the above, you will also prove to yourself what we have found is one of the most difficult principles to teach those who need it most, how to cause desirable actions within yourself. Until you do learn, you will fail to realize that what is left with you when you share it with others will multiply and grow, and what you withhold from others will diminish and decrease. Therefore, share that which is good and desirable and withhold that which is bad and undesirable. Be a part of a great cause. We know of a mother who lost her only child, a beautiful, happy teenage girl who brought laughter and inspiration to all who were fortunate enough to know her. In attempting to neutralize the grief of her loss, this mother developed a most magnificent obsession and became a part of a great cause. Today, she is among the many thousands of American women who are making this world a better world to live in. Because of the wonderful work she is doing and the beauty of her magnificent obsession, we wrote and asked her if she would be kind enough to share with us the inspiration which helped her develop her magnificent obsession. Her response was, The searing agony of losing our beloved daughter is never far away in my mind. Conceived in love and nurtured with love, she held our entire future and all our hopes in every sense of the word. The Almighty took our only child from us at the age of fourteen and a half. It is impossible to describe our loss. The bright promise of the future went dull, for the light of our lives had been snuffed out. Everything that we had lived to the full became empty. All that was sweet turned bitter. My husband and I reacted as does everyone. Our very existence was encompassed by the eternally unanswered question, Why? My husband retired, we sold our home, and seeking an escape did extensive traveling. Only when we came face to face with the harsh reality that we couldn't run away from our sadness and our memories did we return. Slowly, ever so slowly, we recognized that our loss was not exclusive. We had sought solace and found none, for our motives were self-centered. 
It took months for my mind to begin to accept the fact that all the joys of children and good health and security are blessings the Almighty loans to each of us. These infinite mercies, which we finite persons presume to take for granted, should each be cherished for their true meaning and great and irreplaceable value. How could I earn the right to keep my other blessings? How could I show my appreciation and thanks to heaven for allowing me my husband's love, for living in this great nation of ours, for my friends and my five unimpaired senses, for all the good things that surrounded me? Now my efforts to find myself began to move in the right direction. Although bereft of my dearest possession, the Almighty had given me in recompense an empathy with people and a clearer understanding of the problems besetting each of us. Proportionately, my own understanding in relation to adjusting to my loss grew apace as my service in helping others increased. I sought to find the niche in social work that would ultimately give me the opportunity to leave my small heritage for humanity in lieu of my beloved daughter and found the answer in City of Hope. Now, as surely as time passes, my peace of mind, call it a magnificent obsession if you will, gains in stature. It is my earnest wish that all who suffer loss of a loved one can find comfort and serenity in service to others. Today, the City of Hope National Medical and Research Center renders entirely free patient care. Its services are dispensed on the highest humanitarian level in the belief that man is his brother's keeper. This wonderful mother found peace of mind in a truly magnificent obsession. The entire nation, in fact the entire world, can be affected by the magnificent obsession of just one man who wants to share a part of what he has. Orison Sweat Martin was a man who shared a part of what he had and developed a magnificent obsession that changed the attitude of people from negative to positive. The seeds of thought in a book grew into a magnificent obsession. At the age of seven, Orison Sweat Martin became an orphan. He was bound out for his room and board. At an early age, he read Self-Help by the Scottish author Samuel Smiles, who, like Martin, had become an orphan as a young boy and had found the secrets of true success. The seeds of thought in self-help created a burning desire in Martin, which grew into his magnificent obsession and made his world a better world in which to live. During the boom that preceded the Panic of 1893, Martin owned and operated four hotels. Since their operation was entrusted to others, he was devoting much of his time to writing a book. Actually, he was fulfilling a desire to write a book that would motivate American youth as self-help had motivated him. He was working diligently on his inspirational manuscript when an ironical twist of fate struck him and tested his mettle. Martin entitled his work, Pushing to the Front, and he took as his motto, let every occasion be a great occasion, for you cannot tell when fate may be taking your measure for a larger place. And at that very instant, fate was taking his measure for a larger place. The misfortune that struck him would have ruined many a man. What happened? The Panic of 1893 struck. Two of the Marden Hotels burned to the ground. His manuscript, nearly completed, was destroyed. His tangible wealth went down the drain, wiped out. But Martin had a positive mental attitude. He looked about him to see what had happened to the nation and himself. His first conclusion was that the panic was brought on by fear. Fear of the value of the American dollar. Fear caused by the failure of a few large corporations. Fear of stock values and fear of industrial unrest. Those fears caused the stock market to crash. 567 banks and loan and trust companies, as well as 156 railway companies, failed. Strikes were prevalent. Unemployment affected millions of persons. Because of drought and heat, farmers experienced crop failures. Martin looked about him at the shambles in material things and human lives. He saw the great need for someone or something to inspire the nation and its people. Offers came to him to manage other hotels. He turned them down. A desire had caught hold of him. 
a magnificent obsession, and he combined it with PMA. He set to work on a new book. His new motto, a self-motivator, every occasion is a great occasion. If ever there was a time when America needed the help of a positive mental attitude, it is now, he told friends. He worked over a livery stable and lived on one dollar and a half each week. He worked almost unceasingly, day and night. He completed the first edition of Pushing to the Front in 1893. The book received immediate acceptance. It was used extensively in the public schools as a textbook and as a supplementary reader. Business houses circulated it among their employees, distinguished educators, statesmen, and members of the clergy, merchants, and sales managers commended it as a most powerful motivator to a positive mental attitude, and in time, it was printed in 25 different languages. Millions of copies were sold. Martin, like the authors of Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude, believed that character is the cornerstone in building and maintaining success. He believed the highest and best achievements are noble manhood and womanhood, and that the achievement of true integrity and well-rounded character is in itself success. He taught the secrets of financial and business success, but he also entered a perpetual protest against dollar-chasing and overreaching greed. He taught there is something infinitely better than making a living. It is making a noble life. Martin showed how some men may make millions and still be utter failures. Those who sacrifice their families, reputation, health, everything for dollars are failures in life, regardless of how much money they may accumulate. He also taught that one may succeed without becoming a president or a millionaire. Perhaps one of the greatest achievements of Martin's magnificent obsession was the awakening of men and women to the realization that they could experience success if they would only employ the virtues they would like their children to have. Perhaps fully as rewarding to Martin, pushing to the front was instrumental in changing the attitude of an entire nation from negative to positive, and that influence was felt throughout the world. Martin demonstrated that a burning desire can generate the drive to action that is imperative for great achievement. As you have seen, it took courage and sacrifice for Orison Sweat Martin to bring his magnificent obsession into reality. A magnificent obsession does take courage. You may need to stand alone in combating and repelling the ridicule and ignorance of the experts. Like great discoverers, creators, inventors, philosophers, and geniuses, you may be termed crazy, nuts, or a crackpot. The experts may say what you are trying to do can't be done. With time, your burning desire and constant effort will bring your magnificent obsession into reality. When they say it can't be done, find a way to do it. A magnificent obsession will conquer in spite of the obstacles that stand in its way. Many years ago, a student at the University of Chicago and his friends went to hear a lecture by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle on spiritualism. They went for a lark. They meant to scoff. One of these students, J.B. Ryan, was impressed by the seriousness of the speaker. He began to listen. Certain ideas impressed him. He couldn't dismiss them from his mind. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle referred to men of great repute who were searching into the realm of psychic phenomena. J. B. Ryan decided to investigate and to engage in some research. In referring to the incident some time ago, Dr. Ryan, director of the Parapsychology Laboratory at Duke University in North Carolina, said, There were things said there that I should have known as a college student. During and after the lecture, I began to recognize some of them. My education had omitted many of the things that were important, such as ways of seeking the unknown. I began to see some of the faults of the educational system of the day. He became interested in the freedom of all to secure new knowledge. He began to resent a system whereby seeking the truth in any form or on any issue became a taboo. He began to develop a burning desire to learn the truth scientifically regarding man's psychic powers. His burning desire 
turned into a magnificent obsession. Ryan had planned to devote his life to college teaching. He was warned that he would lose his reputation and that his earning power as a teacher would be impaired. His friends and college professors ridiculed him and endeavored to discourage him. Some began to shun him. I must find out for myself, he told a scientist friend. The friend responded, When you do find out, keep it to yourself. No one is going to believe. He did keep his discoveries to himself until he was able to develop confirmed scientific proof. Today he is honored and respected throughout the world. Over the past 45 years, his battles have been figuratively knuckle-fighting every inch of the ground in combating taboos, ignorance, antagonism, and ridicule. One of the greatest obstacles with which Dr. Ryan has been constantly plagued over the years has been the lack of the necessary money for expanding his research. At one time, for example, his only EEG machine was assembled from the remains of one found in a junk pile. It had been discarded by a hospital. Have you ever thought that you can develop a magnificent obsession by becoming a part of a great cause and by sharing a part of what you have? If you have, you already realize that there are many college and university professors today whose magnificent obsessions are to seek the truth in various fields so that all mankind may be benefited by their discoveries. Because such persons spend all their time in searching for these truths, they are almost always handicapped by the lack of money to buy necessary equipment, provide for their own livelihood, and the livings of others engaged in working on the project, etc. You can become a part of such a cause and thus fulfill a magnificent obsession of your own. You can find such a dedicated person in almost any college or university. Money and a Magnificent Obsession You might ask, how can we mention money in the same breath with a magnificent obsession? If you did, we would respond, Isn't money good? Is money good? Is money good? Many negative-minded persons say money is the root of all evil. But the Bible says love of money is the root of all evil. And there is a big difference between the two, even though one little word makes the difference. It has been amazing to the authors to observe negative-minded persons react unfavorably to think and grow rich and its contents. For these negative-minded persons might earn in a single year more than they now earn in a lifetime by changing their attitude from negative to positive. To do this, it would be necessary to clear the cobwebs from their thinking regarding money. In our society, money is the medium of exchange. Money is power. Like all power, money can be used for good or for evil. Think and Grow Rich has motivated many thousands of its readers to acquire great wealth through PMA. They have been inspired in Think and Grow Rich by the biographies of such men as Henry Ford, William Wrigley, Henry L. Doherty, John D. Rockefeller, Thomas Alva Edison, Edward A. Feline, Julius Rosenwald, Edward J. Bach, and Andrew Carnegie. Now the men whose names you have just heard established foundations which even to this day have in the aggregate in excess of one billion dollars, money set aside exclusively for charitable, religious, and educational purposes. Today, expenditures and grants from these foundations total in excess of two hundred million dollars in a single year. Is money good? We know it is. The magnificent obsessions of these men will live in perpetuity. And the story of the life of Andrew Carnegie will convince the listener that Carnegie shared with others a part of what he had, money, philosophy, and something more. In fact, success through a positive mental attitude would not have been written if it were not for Andrew Carnegie. That is why this book is dedicated to him and to you. Let's talk about him and you. Let's learn from his philosophy. Let's see how we can apply it in our lives. A simple philosophy grew into a magnificent obsession. A poor Scottish immigrant boy became the richest man in America. His inspiring story and motivating philosophy 
are found in the autobiography of Andrew Carnegie. As a boy and throughout his life, Carnegie was motivated by a simple fundamental philosophy. Anything in life worth having is worth working for. This simple philosophy grew into a magnificent obsession. And before he died at the age of 83, Carnegie had worked diligently for many years to share his great wealth intelligently with those then living and with future generations. While he lived, Carnegie was successful in giving approximately a half billion dollars through direct grants, foundations, and trusts. His contribution of millions of dollars for the establishment of libraries is a well-known example of the application of his standard. Anything in life worth having is worth working for. And the books in these libraries have been and will continue to be of benefit only to those persons who work to get the knowledge, understanding, and wisdom they contain by reading and studying them. In the year 1900, Napoleon Hill, at the age of 18, while working his way through college as a reporter for a magazine, interviewed the great steelmaker, philosopher, and philanthropist. The first interview lasted three hours, and then the great man invited the youngster to his home. For three days, Carnegie indoctrinated Napoleon Hill with his philosophy, and he finally inspired the young reporter to devote at least twenty years of his life to study, research, and find the simple underlying principles of success. Andrew Carnegie told Napoleon Hill that his greatest wealth consisted not in money, but in what he termed the philosophy of American achievement. He commissioned Napoleon Hill as his agent to share it with the world. And in this book, he is sharing it with you. While he lived, Andrew Carnegie helped Napoleon Hill by giving him letters of introduction to the great men and women of his day. He advised him. He shared his thoughts with him. He helped him in every way with but one exception, money. For he said, anything in life worth having is worth working for. Now he knew that this self-motivator, when applied, would attract happiness and physical, mental, and spiritual health as well as wealth. Everyone can learn and apply Andrew Carnegie's principles. It is customary for a man to share a part of his tangible wealth with his loved ones as he goes through life, or he may do so in his will. This world would be a better world to live in if each person would leave as an inheritance to posterity the philosophy and know-how that brought him happiness, physical, mental, and spiritual health, and wealth, as did Andrew Carnegie. The writings of Napoleon Hill make available to you the principles whereby Carnegie acquired his great wealth. They are just as applicable to you as they were to him. Another wealthy man who had a magnificent obsession and shared a part of what he had was Michael L. Benetton. His close friend, United States Senator Jennings Randolph, told us Benetton started on a salary of $25 a week and became one of the richest men in America. He was worth over $100 million, and yet the turning point in his career followed a very, very minor incident. As a young man of 25, Benetton courteously gave his seat on a train to an elderly stranger. To Benetton, it was the obvious thing to do, and the elderly stranger turned out to be John Worthington, General Superintendent of the South Penn Oil Company. In the conversation that followed, Worthington offered Mike Benetton a job. Benetton accepted and eventually became the discoverer of more oil than any other single individual who ever lived. Some people say you can judge a man by the philosophy by which he lives. Mike Benedum's philosophy about money went something like this. I'm just a trustee for it, and will be held accountable for the good I can accomplish with it, both in the community as a whole and in behalf of opportunities for people coming up, even as I was given an opportunity back when. Like so many others with a magnificent obsession, Benedum lived to a ripe old age. On his 85th birthday, he said, I have been asked how I keep going at my age. My formula is to keep busy so that the years go by unnoticed, to despise nothing except selfishness, meanness, and corruption. 
to fear nothing except cowardice, disloyalty, and indifference, to covet nothing that is my neighbor's except his kindness of heart and his gentleness of spirit, to think many, many times of my friends and, if possible, seldom of my enemies. As I see it, age is not a question of years, it is a state of mind. You are as young as your faith, and today I think I have more faith in my fellow man, in my country, and in my God than I have ever had. You live longer with a magnificent obsession. Of course, it's the old story. The man who has something to live for lives longer. We realized this when we became well acquainted with men like the Honorable Herbert Hoover and General Robert E. Wood, who were doing so much for American youth when they shared their time and money with the Boys Clubs of America. And they were long-lived because of their magnificent obsessions. They devoted their thinking and time to projects that benefited others, and, because their lives were the good lives of men with magnificent obsessions, they experienced the pleasure and therapeutic value of the esteem and love of their fellow men. Of course, you may not have the material wealth of an Andrew Carnegie or a Michael L. Benedum, but that does not deprive you of building your own magnificent obsession. At least it didn't Irving Rudolph. They're all in jail but my brother and me. Irving devoted his life to helping boys in blighted neighborhoods. This work was in gratitude for having been saved by a new boys' club in the rough neighborhood in which he was raised. How did Irving Rudolph get started in boys' club work? He lived in a poor neighborhood, North Avenue and Halstead Street in Chicago. He traveled with a tough crowd. There was plenty of trouble, plenty of things for boys to get into that they shouldn't, and not much to occupy their time to keep them out of trouble. One day, a boys' club was started in an abandoned church in the neighborhood. My brother and I were the only two fellows in our gang who visited the club, Irving explained. They're all in jail but my brother and me. If it hadn't been for the Lincoln Unit Boys Club, we'd be there too. Irving was grateful for what the Boys Club did for him and his brother, and he devoted his life to helping boys in blighted neighborhoods. Through his enthusiasm and zeal, large donations were received to support the Chicago Boys Clubs. Through him, men and women of influence were attracted to this cause. I feel that my work is only a token payment of my gratitude to a higher power for bringing me and my brother under this influence, Irving explained. Then he added, Just visit a boys' club. See for yourself the good work that is being done. You will then feel a part of what I feel for the kids who have the need I had. Now there are thousands of men and women who are fulfilling their magnificent obsessions in sacrificing time and money to help the boys' clubs of America. Your life has benefited from their magnificent obsessions if, if, if you do your best to try to never violate your honor by lying or cheating and always try to fulfill the responsibility with which you are entrusted. If you keep clean in thought and body, if you exemplify clean habits, clean speech, clean sport, if you associate with a clean crowd. If you stand up for the rights of others against the undesirable influence and coaxing of friends and threats of enemies. If defeat inspires you to try to succeed. If you have the courage to face danger in spite of fear. If you work faithfully and make the best of your opportunities. If you don't wantonly destroy property. If you save money so that you can pay your own way in this world and yet be generous to those in need and give financial help and time to worthy causes. If you do a good turn each day without expecting compensation. If you are a friend to all and a brother to every living man, woman, and child, regardless of race, color, or creed. If you are prepared to learn to know dangers, to avoid negligence, and to know the remedies necessary to help injured persons and save human lives to share the duties and responsibilities in your home and place of business. If you are polite to all, especially to the weak, helpless, and unfortunate. If you will not kill or hurt any living creature needlessly, but strive to protect all living animals. If you smile when you can, do your work promptly and cheerfully, 
and if you never shirk or grumble at responsibilities or hardships. If you are loyal to all to whom loyalty is due, to the members of your family, the firm for which you work, and your country. If you respect duly constituted authorities, and obey that which does not violate your moral code. If you do your best to do your duty to God and your country, to help other people at all times, to keep yourself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight, then you live and act in response to the imprint in your subconscious mind of the oath and law of the Boy Scouts of America. What kind of a person would you be if you lived up to these standards? America is great because its people live by a great philosophy. It can be symbolized in the phrase, The Great American Heart. Henry J. Kaiser was another with a magnificent obsession. He did so much to make his world a better world to live in. A quotation that hung on the wall of a blacksmith shop in England inspired him as it may also inspire you. It is. What? Giving again? I ask in dismay. And must I keep giving and giving away? Oh no, said the angel looking me through. Just keep giving till the master stops giving to you. In listening up to this point, you started where the road to achievement began. You were awakened by five mental bombshells for attacking success, and you have been given the key to the citadel of wealth. Now, get ready to succeed. That is the purpose of the following chapters. Pilot number 15. Thoughts to Steer By 1. To develop a magnificent obsession, share yourself with others without expecting a reward, payment, or commendation. Keep your good turns a secret. 2. Regardless of who you are or what you have been, you can create inside yourself a burning desire to be helpful to others. You can develop your own magnificent obsession if you have PMA. 3. When you share with others a part of what you have, that which remains will multiply and grow. The more you share, the more you will have. Therefore, share that which is good and desirable, and withhold that which is bad and undesirable. 4. You can develop your own magnificent obsession by becoming a part of a good cause, as did the mother who lost her only child. 5. Character is the cornerstone in building and maintaining success. But how can you improve your own character? Success through a positive mental attitude will help you find the right answers. 6. There is something infinitely better than making a living. It is making a noble life. Do you believe this? If you do, what will you do about it? 7. A burning desire can generate the drive to action that is imperative to great achievement. To develop a burning desire to achieve a specific goal, daily keep the goal before you and strive to achieve it. 8. It takes courage and sacrifice to develop and maintain a magnificent obsession. You may need to stand alone against the ridicule and ignorance of others, as did Dr. Joseph Banks Ryan. 9. Some people say money is the root of all evil, but the Bible says love of money is the root of all evil. The good or evil of money is contingent on a little difference. That little difference is whether your attitude is positive or negative. 10. Men like Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, and Michael Benedum use the power of their money to establish charitable, educational, and religious foundations. The good that has been done by the magnificent obsessions of such men will live in perpetuity. 11. Anything in life worth having is worth working for. 12. When you are asked to give money or time to a worthy cause, repeat to yourself, What? Giving again? I ask in dismay. And must I keep giving and giving away? Oh no, said the angel looking me through. Just keep giving till the Master stops giving to you. That which you share with others will multiply, and that which you withhold will diminish. Part 4. Get Ready to Succeed Chapter 16. How to Raise Your Energy Level 
How is your energy level today? Did you wake up eager to face the tasks ahead? Did you push your chair back from the breakfast table with the feeling that you were raring to go? And did you plunge into your work with enthusiasm? You didn't? Perhaps for some time now, you just haven't had the vim and vigor you think you should have. Perhaps you feel tired before the day begins and drag through your work without joy. If so, let's do something about it. Vernon Wolf, track coach, is an expert who can show us what to do. He is one of the outstanding coaches in the country. Under his tutelage, several high school students have broken national prep school records. How does he train these stars? Wolf has a double prescription. He teaches them to condition both their minds and their bodies simultaneously. If you believe you can do it, says Vernon Wolf, most of the time you can. It's mind over matter. You have two types of energy. One is physical, the other is mental and spiritual. The latter is by far the more important, for from your subconscious mind you can draw vast power and strength in time of need. Think, for example, of the great feats of strength and endurance you've read about people performing while under the stress of intense emotion. There is an automobile accident, and a husband is pinned under the overturned car. In her moment of fear and determination, his tiny and frail wife manages to raise the car enough to free him. Or the insane person, his mind dominated by a subconscious running wild, can break, lift, bend, and smash with a force he never could hope for during periods of normality. In a series of articles for Sports Illustrated, Dr. Roger Bannister told how he first broke the four-minute mile on May 6, 1954, by training both his mind and his muscles to accomplish this long-sought dream of the athletic world. For months, he conditioned his subconscious into the belief that the record, which some people claimed was unattainable, could be achieved. Others thought of the four-minute mark as a barrier. Bannister thought of it as a gateway, which if he once passed through, would open the way to many new records for himself and other milers. And of course, he was right. Roger Bannister led the way. In a period of little more than four years after he first set a four-minute mile, the feat was performed 46 times by himself and other runners. And in one race at Dublin, Ireland, on August 6, 1958, five runners ran the mile in less than four minutes. The man who taught Roger Bannister the secret was Dr. Thomas Kirk Curitan, director of the Physical Fitness Laboratory at the University of Illinois. Dr. Curitan has developed revolutionary ideas concerning the body's energy level. They apply, he says, to both athletes and non-athletes. They can make a runner run faster and the average man live longer. There is no reason why, Dr. Curitan says, any man can't be as fit at 50 as he was at 20, providing he knows how to train his body. Dr. Curitan's system is based on two principles. One, train the whole body. Two, push yourself to the limit of endurance, extending the limit of each workout. The art of record-breaking, he says, is the ability to take more out of yourself than you've got. You punish yourself more and more and rest between spells. Dr. Curitan became acquainted with Roger Bannister while running physical fitness tests on European athletic stars. He noticed that Bannister's body was wonderfully developed in some ways. For example, his heart was 25% larger than normal in relation to his body size. But in other ways, Bannister wasn't as well developed as the average man. Bannister took Curitan's advice to develop his whole body. He learned to condition his mind by taking up mountain climbing. This taught him how to overcome obstacles. Equally important, he learned to break big goals down into little ones. Roger Bannister reasoned that a man ran a single quarter mile faster than he ran the four quarters of a full mile. So he trained himself to think of the four quarters in the mile separately. In his training, he would dash a quarter mile, then jog a lap around the track to rest. Then he would dash another quarter mile. Each time, he aimed to run the quarter in 58 seconds or less. 58 times 4 equals 232 seconds, or... 3 minutes and 52 seconds. He ran to the point of collapse, then he would rest. Each time, the point of collapse was pushed back a little. 
When he finally ran his great race, it was in 3 minutes 59.6 seconds. Dr. Curitan taught Roger Bannister that the more the body endures, the more it will endure. Beliefs about overtraining and staleness, he says, are myths. But he emphasizes that rest is as important as exercise and activity. The body needs to rebuild in even larger quantities what has been torn down in exercise. That's how strength, vitality, energy are developed. The body and mind both recharge themselves during periods of rest and relaxation. If you don't give them a chance to do so, severe damage and even death can result. Is it time to recharge your battery? There's no glory in being the richest man in the graveyard. You don't want to be the best scientist, doctor, executive, salesman, or employee lying prematurely under the most ornate headstone. A loved mother, wife, father, son, or daughter can bring happiness. Why then bring grief instead? Why be confined to a mental sanitarium or lie embalmed six feet under a blanket of beautiful green grass simply because a needless drain damaged a battery that wasn't recharged? The small child doesn't know when he is excessively tired, but he surely shows it in his behavior and actions. The adolescent may realize he is overfatigued, but refuse to admit it, even to himself. Then sexual, family, scholastic, and social problems may seem unsolvable and unbearable. They may motivate him to temporary or permanent destructive acts, acts that injure himself and others. When your energy level is low, your health and your desirable characteristics may be subdued by the negative. You, like a storage battery, are dead when your energy level is zero. What is the solution? Recharge your battery. How? Relax, play, rest, and sleep. How to tell when your battery needs recharging. Here is a checklist to help you determine your present energy level. You can use it whenever you feel that your energy level is slipping. If you are a well-balanced person, your battery may need recharging when you act and feel unduly sleepy or tired, tactless, unfriendly, suspicious, querulous, insulting, hostile, irritable, sarcastic, mean, nervous, excitable, hysterical, worrisome, fearful, jealous, rash, ruthless, excessively selfish, excessive emotional, depressed, or frustrated. PMA demands a good energy level and vice versa. When you are fatigued, your usually positive, desirable feelings, emotions, thoughts, and actions have a tendency to turn negative. When you are rested and in good health, the direction is changed back to positive. Fatigue often brings out the worst within you. When your battery is charged and your energy and activity level is up to standard, you are at your best. That is when you think, think and act with PMA. If your feeling actions indicate better, better qualities are being subdued by those which are undesirable and negative, it's time to recharge your battery. Yes, to maintain your level of both physical and mental energy, you need to exercise both your body and mind. But there is a third factor. Your body and mind both need to be fed properly. You help to maintain your physical body by taking in quantities of wholesome, nutritious foods. You maintain your mental and spiritual vigor by absorbing mental and spiritual vitamins from inspirational and religious books.